If we can have uh, everyone take their seats, that'd be great. It's uh, 9.31, I'm a minute late. <laughs> so first of all, thank you everyone for coming. I do need to say an uh, apology up front. I have to scoot out of here at 10.45. Um, I apologize, um, I've been called to a meeting with some folks in Los Angeles. Um, so it could be potential money for the system, so I'm gonna go and see what the potential money might be. So it's with some big funders, and so, um, so think about me as I'm going up to 110, going to downtown LA, which is not my favorite place to go to, off of Flower Street, um, which is not the other favorite place to go to, so Leah. But um, we do have a good meeting for you, a packed meeting, um, so we'll always start like we do with introductions. And so, in fact, r yeah, Ray, why don't you start with Dr. Baker? Good morning, I'm Jill Baker, Deputy Superintendent of Schools. Hey, good morning, I'm Brian Moskovitz, the Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools. Sit at the table. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Lund, I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Research and School Improvement. Excuse me. Diana Craighead, good morning, everybody, Board of Education. Good morning, Megan Kerr from the Board of Education. Good morning, Pamela Secchi, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum. Uh, my name is Jordan Tracy. I represent Cubberly K through eight. I have a daughter um, who's in second grade there. We're just doing intros, I assume. Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Molly Watson. I work for Courage Campaign, um, and then I also live in Long Beach and have a four-year-old who's about to enter into TK. <laughs> good morning. I'm Lisa Dempsey. I'm representing Rogers Middle School. Good morning, my name is Mariela Salgado and I have a kindergartner at Prisk Elementary and I'm here also representing um, Edison Elementary. Monique Gray representing Colin Powell. I have one daughter and I also have girls at Jordan High School. Introduce yourself. Yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Robert Collins. Um, my son goes to Fremont and I would like to say uh, today that I'm an LGBTQ advocate. Morning, Wendy Sanchez, School District Interpreter. Hi, I'm Dasha Gorski, and I have a junior at Millican and one at McBride. Adele Snow, representing Gompers. All three of mine are there. <laughs> Good morning, Kateria Hernandez, and I'm part of the elementary office. Good morning, I'm Kimberly Johnson and I'm from the Equity Access College and Career Readiness Office. I'm Rick Turrentine, uh, the guy that just won't go away. <laughs> <laughs> graduated from Poly in the 60s, my parents graduated from Poly in the 30s. Uh, I've got uh, three grandkids currently in the system, uh, one at Lakewood, uh, one at Rogers, and I'm representing Naples, and I have a daughter at uh, Stanford Middle School. The principal. <laughs> Chuck Howard representing Wilson High School. And Marika, you wanna? Hi. Hi everybody, I'm Marika Manos. I'm the History, Social Science, Civics Coordinator at the Orange County Department of Ed. I'm the former sort of former history, social science curriculum leader, K-12 here in Long Beach Unified. Um, and I just need to give Mr. Collins a little huggy. <laughs> in person. <laughs> nice to me. It's nice to meet you in person. Marika has uh, agreed uh, graciously to, to come and speak to us today. So we have a, a packed agenda. We have um, Marika is going to um, report on the FAIR Act. Then um, Brian is going to talk about um, our reading program and our assessments. And then Dr. Line is going to bring back the high school readiness guide that you folks um, have looked at as well as multiple groups because it's going to print. And we're very excited about that. Just to, for the um, reminder for all folks and for those who are new, um, our, we just have a couple norms for our group. One is that the, the parent forum is really about big topics that we talk about in the system. That's why we, we have these three topics today. Um, if there's time at the end, Dr. Baker has graciously agreed um, to, uh, you know how I always say agree, it's that they, they got volunteered. So to, to take questions, <laughs> to take questions at the end and to do the door prizes for us. Um, and, the, um, and for folks who haven't been here before, this is filmed and so it will, um, uh, um, 
the OMS is going to be videotaping this, and it will be put up on our website um, forever um, for anybody else to see um, in about um, probably four or five days after this is done. Um, the norms are we are respectful of everyone's opinions. Um, the other one is that if you have a personal um, question, you can either see Dr. Baker at the end or you can email me at the end because, uh, unfortunately, again, I had to leave. But I do want to do one thing before I, I leave. So Marika is, is just a good person, a good human being, but she is a dedicated LBUSD person as she got this huge promotion to, to Orange County um, Department of Ed. Their um, win or loss, she agreed to come back and, and to do this. So I just want to say thank you. Aww, so, so, thank you. So. Thank you. We will keep these for you. you. <laughs> Up with you. these. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Perfect. So, so, thank you so much. So, so. That's so sweet. These are gorgeous. Thank you. Um, so I'm here today. <laughs> Mike. Okay, we're 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 uh, taping. Sorry. Um, so I'm here today to talk about a piece of legislation that was passed in 2011 and has been um, kind of put to the limelight with a new textbook adoption in history, social science. So. A lot of you have probably heard about the Fair Education Act, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is, what are sort of the implications for teacher practice, what can you expect, and kind of talk about like the why of the Fair Education Act too. So you guys have this in your um, classroom too if you want to follow along, and I have some links in the presentation too. So everything, all the documents that you have in front of you regarding the Fair Education Act are also linked here. Um, I'm going to use a lot of acronyms, and so if there's something that you know you want me to slow down on, you have questions on, just stop me or just raise your hand and. I'll take questions throughout the presentation, but I'm going to do a little bit of talking um, just so then uh, you guys have a little bit of a background. Okay. So I want you to think about your own experience as a student, and I want you to think about the extent to which you were represented in your curriculum. Did you feel like your teachers were talking about you when they were teaching you history, science, English, math, were they talking about you? So just take a minute and in your own, in your own thoughts, were you in your curriculum? Okay. So how many of you said no? Okay. How many of you said kind of, but I don't really like the way it was presented? You could, yeah. Okay. Um, how many of you said yes? I was there. All right, so our goal as teachers, as educators, is to make sure that we provide windows and mirrors for all of our students. So we want kids to be able to see themselves, and it might not be themselves exactly, it might be their family experience, their traditions. Um, it might just be, oh, this is somebody that I can relate to, right? They want to see themselves in what we teach. Um, and then we want to see windows. We actually want to be able to learn about other people, see beyond our own experience. Um, and for a lot of us in the room, we were just looking out the window. We didn't necessarily see ourselves in the mirror. Um, the whole why to the Fair Education Act kind of goes with that. So the Fair Education Act Go ahead and take a minute and read, read this, um, this uh, verbiage. Take a minute and read this slide. Okay, so the Fair Education Act was passed to make sure that we study the role and contributions of both men and women, Native Americans, African Americans, Mexican Americans, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, European Americans, lesbians, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans, persons with disabilities, and members of other ethnic and cultural groups. That's a lot of people, a lot of groups. In addition 
Some of these groups intersect, right? You could be gay and African American. You could be Mexican American and have a disability. So, so we have to consider all groups when we're teaching. And we have to make sure that our children see themselves there somewhere. So why do we care about this? We've talked about the fact that we want kids to see themselves in the curriculum and also to see others. We know from educational research that this improves academic outcomes because we're creating good humans that can talk to others, that can be good citizens and be okay with perspectives that are much different than their own. And even like know that there's a perspective that's outside of their realm of possibility, right? We also want to provide a safe environment for all students. And we're gonna look at the GLSEN data. This is a link to the GLSEN website. Um, and we're gonna look at some of that data in a second. But basically we know that lots of our students face verbal and physical harassment at school. And as part of the school climate data, the number one thing that students said helped them was seeing themselves in the curriculum. It wasn't just the adult that made a difference. It was what they were taught. It was the content. The content made a difference for kids. And this, these, this data comes from kids themselves. The other reason why the Fair Education Act is important is because, like what I was talking about before, is we want to challenge the single story. So I taught history. I taught US history. There are um, parts of the book that might say, oh, this is what um, African Americans experienced during World War II. Well, did all African Americans in World War II have that same experience? Probably not. Right? And so getting kids to think about that there isn't just one narrative for any one group is really, really important. Obviously, not all uh, European Americans have the same experience. Not all people coming from, say, Greek Americans, like my experience, have the same experience. Your class makes a difference. Your, uh, your multiple identities make a difference in what you care about, what you do. And then the last part of FAIR is it's represented in the History Social Science Framework, which was adopted in 2016. So I started this presentation saying to you that the FAIR Education Act was passed in 2011. However, teachers didn't necessarily have tools for implementation of the FAIR Education Act because of some state funding that went away during the recession. And so we had started writing curriculum and writing narrative and support for teachers in, I think it was 2013. That got slowed down by some budget cuts. And so now they finally passed a new framework. And then two years later, they have new adopted texts. And then Long Beach will be adopting texts in two more years. So it's a slow process, but eventually, kids are going to get more access to more voices in their curriculum. Okay, take a minute and look at this chart. So did anybody notice anything promising in these numbers? That's maybe going down. Okay, so that's good. So what this is talking about is that students have faced some harassment, some bullying, verbally, physically, and actually being physically assaulted because of their gender identity or expression. Um, one of the things that kids said was when I had teachers that talked about maybe individuals who are LGBTQ, I felt safer to be who I was. When I had friends who actually were in another class, that, ha that were taught about individuals who are LGBTQ, 
I felt safe with my peer groups. So this is a huge impetus for why the FARA Education Act was passed. So what does it apply to? It applies to the adoption of all instructional materials. So anytime science, math, English, history, health, PE, any instructional materials are adopted, they go through a process and they have sort of a rubric that people in curriculum and instruction as well as teachers look at to decide whether those instructional materials are actually processed. And one of those heuristics or, or places is looking to make sure that everybody who's in the textbook is accurately portrayed and there isn't bias. Okay, And then the most important part as far as um, maybe the history social science classroom is looking at developmentally appropriate ways of talking about individuals and ways that fit into the, the history or social science curriculum. So I'm going to spend some time talking about individuals who are LGBTQ because this tends to be the area where um, people might need some clarification about what does that look like from for my students. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about where that is in the curriculum. So just take a minute or two and read this slide. Actually linked to the history social science framework. It's 1,400 pages long. So I did not print it out today. Um, <laughs> I know we, li we like to talk a lot in history and, and write a lot too. So it's good. So take a minute and read this slide and then I'll kind of unpack it a little bit. Okay, so as you can see from a K-5 perspective, the units that are affected are in grades two, four, and five. The legislation in the FAIR Act specifically talks about U.S. history. Um, and so you're going to find LGBTQ specifically mentioned in these three grades, K-5. However, grade two, it's not necessarily we have to instruct kids about what it means to be gay or lesbian or bisexual. We're just saying, yeah, there's families, and some families have two mommies, and some families have two daddies. Some families have a grandma or grandpa, and some families just have an uncle, or some families have a foster mom. Or So getting kids to really understand that your family might not look like everybody else's family. And your family is actually here, and we're going to talk about your family. So that's what the second grade curriculum is like. The, there is a more explicit discussion of LGBTQ in the fourth grade in the civil rights movement because the fourth grade is California history. So there is a discussion in the framework about talking about Harvey Milk specifically as an advocate for LGBTQ rights. And we did identify um, a resource that was specifically for Harvey Milk. Um, the other piece that you'll find a lot throughout all the grade levels is this questioning of gender roles. So what does it mean to what does it mean to be a woman during the gold rush? Or what does it mean to be a woman during the colonial era? Why did some women dress up like men and fight during the revolution? I've, I've heard that the uh, LBUSD summoned the Long Beach Historical Society to write some books about local history. And I'm wondering, I, I got a ha uh, hold of, I think it's like four books. Is that, being is that part of this um, second, fourth, or fifth grade? Because I think it's like a third grade uh, reading level. Is that, is that still part of the curriculum for our K through five or third graders? I don't know what grade it is for. Yeah, so they're resources, and they're actually really cool resources there. So third grade is local history, and um, this work was done, I want to say 10 years ago or more, and all the teachers uh, who taught third grade were given class sets, so like I think six of each book, and there were four books. Um, it's not part of the curriculum in as much as they're a resource for the curriculum. So 
Um, for history social science, the curriculum is in the textbook. And then there are lots of resources that through the history office and through um, the Office of Curriculum and Professional Development, um, we offer support, but it's through the textbook. So the teachers have access. However, if they wanted to use it they and they didn't have the books, we'd have to order more books and they could have it as a resource for sure. So when you say it's a resource, the reason why I'm, I'm asking about that specifically uh -huh. is because in those books you have like a, I think a Pacific Islander that is included that I think it's important in this framework of FAIR Act and, and you know inclusiveness. There's a, a woman that uh, fostered I think like a hundred kids. So th these books to me speak to what that means on a, on a, on this, in this framework as well as what that means locally. Like here's someone tangible in our history that you can relate to. Yeah, so, and so those resource books are means awesome. it's just available, or is resource mean it's actually being asked upon the teachers to include that in their teaching? Because I think that makes a big difference. As a parent, I would love to know that my daughter's reading that, those books, as opposed to it just being available in the library. So it's not in the library, it's in classrooms. And I say it's a resource because it's been several years since we distributed them and there's been a lot of changes with regard to teachers and there is no mandated framework for k-5 for history social science in the sense that a lot of the k-5 curriculum is integrated into their english language arts instruction but before before we get get into too many questions i think i'm going to speak to some of what you're thinking about with regard to other resources too in a minute. So do you want to add something really quick, Mr. Uh, Collins? Yeah. Just uh, to somewhat piggyback on that, uh, like I know you guys did like a little guide for teachers. You created it with teachers on the fair. And I think in third grade, they talked about like Mayor Garcia and that he's, you know, he's gay, he's Latino. Um, it's kind of that intersection as well. Like, but my question is if a teacher just doesn't say it, like how would a teacher even know to bring that up in the curriculum, maybe in third grade? So I'm not sure that they would. I think that where they might is because in third grade, they're talking about local, local government, right? And so they might talk about Mayor Garcia, but I'm not sure that they would bring up his sexual orientation um, unless it was driven by the students. So a lot of what I kind of encourage teachers to do is use inquiry and questioning to kind of get the kids to drive the instruction. And I think that it really depends on context whether that's gonna be appropriate material in that particular setting. Um, so because it's not explicit in the framework, there's no mandate for, say, a third grade teacher to talk about um, uh, the mayor's sexual orientation. However, in fourth grade, they would need to talk about Harvey Milk because that is in the state mandated curriculum. Oh, the framework, I, or the framework items, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I could see how it could come up, say, if it was, you know, discussed as part of this discussion of local government. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so then when we look at fifth and eighth grade, there's a lot of discussion about gender roles. There's not necessarily a lot about. LGBTQ individuals, and most of that has to do with the fact that prior to the 1900s, there weren't really good labels for people who were gay. I mean, you wouldn't call yourself a lesbian until maybe the 1970s. Um, homosexual was a term in the 1950s, so it kind of depends, and so the history it, it's hard to put an identity on a person that didn't use that identity label themselves. Um, so that's another interesting question that stu students can discuss with their teachers too. Where you find a lot more discussion about LGBTQ individuals is in the high school, especially in 11th grade. So um, when talking about civil rights, you're going to see that in 11th grade, but also in the Cold War with regard to the lavender scare. So just like we had the red scare where people were discriminated against for being communists, that we also had people who were discriminated against for being LGBTQ, 
during the 1950s. Um, and then in modern world history, you're going to find um, lots of instances where LGBTQ individuals are discussed <laughs> in terms of contributions and also sort of constraints. Yes. Uh, question. Yes. Uh, as a Pacific Islander, I would like to know, before we start implementing all these things for our students, is there a possibility that we as parents need to be educated on this particular framework? Second question okay. is, uh, because it's, it's important for all of us to be aware of, and as we're talking about uh, issues which in our culture we don't have gender. Yeah. All of us are welcome. Yeah. You know, we all want people. And um, the thing is, we, I didn't know about race until I came to this country. And um, what I t we talk about gay issues, we need to talk about race issues. Be aware of who we are as people. Yes. Because we know who you are, but you don't know who I am. Right. And that's something needs to be discussed in your history. Yes, and something that I talk a lot about with my students and with teachers is that I am not who I am not who I think I am, and I am not who you think I am. Sometimes I am who I think you think I am, and that that's really kind of scary for kids to wrap their minds around. Like, and I think even even our elementary, my four-year-old gets this that she sometimes, some of her identities are wrapped up in what other people think of her. Um, and so race and ethnicity is socially constructed. You bring up a really important point. Um, if you look at this document that I shared with you, it kind of gives you a sense, uh, this is like an overview document of the framework. Um, and it has all of the pieces of legislation that were wrapped up in the history social science framework. Um, there are two specific calls out for Filipino Americans. However, when we were doing our resource kind of collection, we were looking specifically for Pacific Islanders in addition to Filipinos because of our community in Long Beach. But um, there's very, I. I read the whole framework content-wise, and there are very few places where the Pacific Islander community is specifically mandated. However, um, in the seventh grade curriculum, there's a really great unit where there's some big opportunities for that, so I've talked to my seventh grade teachers about that. But there's a lot more work to be done, and I do think that it would be an exciting experience for parents to do a little study around the framework, maybe alongside some teachers, but that is not my decision to make. Um, but yeah, I mean, the co if you read the narrative of the framework, which is uh, accessible online, it's, it's very beautiful and it's in line with current scholarship. It's great. So hopefully our teachers are using it as a resource and they will be as we do as we do our textbook adoption. So, um, that being said, what we've tried to do in Long Beach Unified is identify some books that teachers can use before the adoption occurs. And so, um, Chris Steinhauser has purchased 30 books for K-5 for each classroom teacher is gonna get five books and they're going to have some questions that are aligned to the framework. You, you have, this is a draft right here, so it might change as we implement. Um, but you guys can look at this and take some time to um, see some of the questions there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how I collected those books and worked on the collection of those books and some of the populations that we looked at. So um, September through November, we spent time looking at books. So we looked at chapter books, we looked at picture books. We wanted to provide resources that teachers in the elementary would use to better implement the FAIR Act and also represent those voices you were talking about and do so in a way that doesn't necessarily take a whole unit to teach. 
So it's a drop-in lesson. You can read this book today and ask some questions about it, maybe fit it within your English curriculum. Um, all of the books that we looked at have won awards. We're on recommended lists. We looked through professional reviews, parent reviews. We wanted to make sure that we identified books that were also underrepresented in our current holdings. Um, so this is sort of how um, Crystal Miranda, who's the head librarian, she and I worked on this project extensively. And then we also got support from the Gate Office, from the English Language Arts Office, from the Office for Special Ed, all in curriculum. So we got lots of voices to kind of look at the book titles that we chose. And you can see these are some of the books here. Um, and I'll kind of highlight a couple of those in a minute. Um, this is not a complete chart, but these are some of the, the titles that we queried. So we tried to look, if there were categories for LGBTQ, how many titles did we have in the district? We had 25. So we knew that we needed to make sure that students um, had more access to books about LGBTQ. We didn't have a good query for special education, um, but we also knew that over 13% of our students about are represented with IEPs, and we wanted to make sure to include that group. So those are the two big groups that we focused on for each grade level. And then with regard to other groups, we looked through and tried to represent pieces and accounts that really fit with the curriculum and then represented authentic voices. Um, and also really focused on some contributions as well as possible constraints. So um, I don't remember your name. Tell me your name. Yes, Molly. yeah. Molly. So Molly brought up the issue of like, what was the ethnic and identity background of those people who were choosing the books? So um, both of us, um, both Crystal and I would identify as white or other. I'm. I identify as white ethnic because I, I'm a Greek. My dad is a first generation um, in the United States. My yaya is from Leros in Greece. Um, he was an English language learner. We have lots and lots of stories to talk about our ethnic identity struggles in the last 60 years. However, we're both white from what outsiders would say. Um, however, other group, other people that supported us are from African American. Um, I, I feel weird kind of labeling the, the people in the group, but, but it's, no, I, I totally get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a diverse group, um, more women than men because we have very few men in our um, department and that's because in this teacher population there's just more women um, there was nobody that identifies openly as lgbtq however i would say everybody in that group is openly an ally um, but i don't think the research says that you have to have that identity to have the intellectual capacity to have empathy but there is something about teaching and having that identity to, that helps support navigating those questions. Yeah. I realize that more women work in education than men do historically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm failing to see the, like I see an opportunity anyways to bring people in if possible. For sure. Um, as well as the fact that like, I do feel like it is important to be explicit about like who is putting that information together, who is writing the resources that we are gathering, as well as like, you know, I'm looking up here and I see there's over 4,000 library titles for African Americans, but like what African American experiences are they talking about? Like, right, right. I don't ever remember learning about anything that happened through like the transatlantic slave route after they used the route. As a Caribbean American, uh, my dad's from Haiti. He's I'm first generation here. Like, I, and I know I'm not like highly represented within the community or in California, but still I'm but just it saying like matter, yeah. which identities are really there, and is that part of the formation before you guys put this work in? Because it sounds like you put a lot of work in. So I'm just saying, uh, just like a perspective of it. No, uh, it and feels I, I think that um, part of our impetus is to get the work done very quickly because we had the gaps in 
the instructional materials that we have. And so I think that over the course of implementation, after we purchase the books and we implement them next year, we will have more feedback and maybe we'll add titles and change. And so I, I think it just kind of, I, curriculum's fluid, right? And a lot of it depends on the teacher and the parents and the community. And I personally, as an educator, never felt like my curriculum was the same based on who was in my class. So I, I definitely think there's that opportunity, but we just kind of have to start with what we've got, with the resources we have, and then see see how it goes but no and i and i think we have to look for workforce diversity and all that but those are like p16 pipeline issues and my friends at cal state long beach and i talk um like preschool through college discussions that we have to have with making sure that everybody's prepared to maybe possibly become educators and thinking through what that means and and actually busting the sort of gender norms of I mean my mom told me she's like you should be a teacher so then when you have kids you have summers off that's why I became a teacher I was a political scientist so I and I would say a lot of our teachers probably have had a similar experience, and a lot of our male teachers have felt a different experience with regard to, am I gonna be able to provide for my family? So they, these are real issues that, that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day, right? Yeah, but it is really, it's really important. Yeah, yeah. I'm taking way too much time, sorry. Okay. Personally, we have to face the fact that no matter what we implement it to our students, mm -hmm. teachers need to be accountable of what they're teaching to our students. Because Pacific Islander, the latest statistics, 54% of them fail math or fail English, and 63% of them fail math. So no matter what you're standing out there and say, we need to focus on the reality. And any changes happen here, it takes 12 years to see the reality of anything we do. I'm a statistician, I know exactly what I'm talking about. So whatever changes, like you're saying, you need to move with the changes. So you, if you start something, start it right. Yeah. Have everyone get involved and do it right because yeah. I want my representative, Pacific Islander, because this district call us silent. We are the silent group. I'm not silent anymore. Good. No more. I am standing up and I am gonna voice. I'm gonna march and make sure that no, every kid's graduated and every kid's do not fail because the system's been failing our children and no more. Yeah, and, and I, I want to make sure that I'm thoughtful about time. Um, and there's another question too. Um, before I take more questions, I want to just give you one more. I want to finish kind of some of the content. And I just want to speak to that really quickly. Um, as parents, I think that sometimes we don't feel like we can share resources. If you, ha if you have resources that you think that we should look at in our for our curriculum, you can contact us um, because it was really hard finding um, stories about kids and about individuals who are Pacific Islander. Most of the books were in not in English. Um, and so if you have resources that you wanna share, I think that would be really helpful. I contacted our local museum and got some ideas. But I, I think this work is hard work. It's hard work for those of us in curriculum and it's hard work for everybody. We have to do it together as a community. Um, I'll come back to you. I just wanted to let you know, we also kind of looked for other, other appropriateness things. We looked at questionable references and we had to make sure that the educational and social content was there. Um, and then you, this is the link to the books that you guys have in front of you. And then I actually, at, this is 
if you click on this top resource here, this is from LA County Office of Ed, their resources about the FAIR Act. So you can go there if you wanna look there. But I do wanna make sure um, I have a little bit of time for questions because it seems like some of you have some questions that I wanna make sure that you um, can ask except now I can't get back to my presentation, so I might need a little help with that. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, oh, it didn't come up there at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. So if you click on the, any of those links in the slide, you'll get some resources. There's actually some videos on the LACO site, um, and you can watch those videos. And then I have my card here, too. I'll leave it up on the front table if you want to contact me after this presentation. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Okay, so you, you had a question. Kind of. Okay. Um, Comment. With the recent strike in LAUSD, it brought a big attention nationally to the need of funding at the state and federal level. Um, so that's what definitely came out, you know, the positive uh, impact that that had to bring more attention, the fact that we have just, just we haven't had enough funding at the state level, um, but we, they, they, they continue to fight as we speak. Are you talking about for education? In general, yeah, okay. in education. Okay. Um, Long Beach, though, you know, with the recent parent university outreach, the classes that, that have been advertised numerous times, which I appreciate, it took a lot of advocacy here. It's, it's taken a lot of advocacy at the, at the elementary levels, middle school and high school, and that needs to continue when we're gone. Um, but most importantly, I think the passion that the parents will continue to hopefully, uh, the contagious passion, the contagious involvement that needs to never stop. Um, we know how our kids work at home. We know those conversations have to happen. So like when you're talking about the empowering ability to just empower the children at home, sometimes a curriculum may not be relatable exactly. to the experience. Um, I, for one, was empowered when I went to the university, when I learned about the Chicano movement and the importance of advocacy not just for the Chicanos, but for all human rights. So I, th I wanna encourage everyone to encourage others, parents that cannot be here um, for whatever reason, but just to have those candid conversations. You know, Dasha and I have been friends since our kids have been in kindergarten, and we empower and we encourage other parents to not give up, you know, to simply be involved. Be, we could, in short, we can always complain, we can always be upset, and understandably so, but we are allies, you know, we have all worked together. And I think that's the, that's the point because the, the young people are looking for those leaders at home, at school, in our community, so that they can be empowered to pass that on to future generations. Yeah, it really, it takes a village to raise our kids. And it, I, I think after I have a, almost two-year-old and almost five-year-old after I had children, it totally changed my perspectives on education. And um, it's not that I didn't care and didn't get it, but now I get it. It's like there is nothing that anybody could do that would be good enough for my, my daughters. Now, that being said, if we could get every teacher to think that way about the children in their room, I, th I mean, I, I say that to teachers a lot. Well, if you were this child's parent, what would you want? Um, and I think that's a nice perspective to have. I don't think that's always possible. And I think that kind of goes back to what you're saying is like once you sat in somebody else's shoes. But that doesn't mean that just because you don't have kids that you can't be an excellent teacher. Yeah. What were we going to say in that? Okay. Like today's uh, meetings, especially from some of the parents, have been inspirational for me. Um, I would just like to echo, I've been to a couple of parent university classes now, and they're excellent. Um, you know, my experience 
with SP48 has been both very good. You know, I, I shared talking with Dr. Steinhauser. I felt he was very transparent to very bad, where some teachers just say, we don't do that. I mean, and that's it. That's the end of the conversation. And then so sometimes we had to go, I had to go to the principal. If I could give my principal a little bit of a shout out, Dr. Richards at Fremont, um, she did come up with a system where she said she was going to ask once a month, she meets with all her teachers, and she asked them many questions. How are you helping kids who are second language learners? How are you making sure that uh, your kids with disabilities are being successful? And she's adding the question of SB48, how are all kids seeing themselves? But coming back to a point over here, which I really appreciated, I think sometimes you have to be general, Maritza, and sometimes you have to be specific. Because sometimes I feel like teachers are very uncomfortable getting specific. They say, well, I just represent all kids. I right. teach all kids. Right. But then when you ask them, like for me, well, have you mentioned a gay individual in history? No, we don't do that. Well, I'm, and I, my next question, it kind of gets maybe a little heated, but it's like, but I thought you represent all kids. Right. So there seems to be a little bit of disparity. And I just come back to, I feel I'm very pro-teacher. And, but I think about accountability. If teachers aren't being asked the question, a lot of times they're just not doing it. And I feel that's a reality. And if we don't recognize reality, then we're not being honest. Yeah. And maybe the answer needs to be not yet. I need to learn more. And that would be a much better answer. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to piggyback on what he said. Um, if, on a principal level, I think it makes a big difference when you have a principal that's looking to do that and who's willing to have a conversation with parents. So I, it, one of the things I've, I've mentioned before is about sharing best practices and holding these principals accountable because I can tell you from personal experience, I have two different principals I work with, one at Edison and one at Prisk, and it's two different, completely different experiences. But my second point or question, suggestion was, um, I'm curious to know, I, I'm, I'm a new parent in ki with a kindergartner, but I just learned, for instance, like there's art classes that are being held in, cla in after school programs. And one of the things I've seen or learned along the way is that art history is being taught on a, only on a European um, influence. And I'm curious to know if that's an easier, maybe just one, one thing to tackle also, or easier to mandate or easier to suggest in terms of having different influences so that you know when my daughter takes art class after school it doesn't just come with one palette it comes with you know Frida Kahlo African American history influences Caribbean like a, a little more than just one because I think I find it unfair that it, it she's only learning one and even something so basic that I, I only heard from another parent that the color pigments of the kids that use it, you know, she said, I, I, had, I had to talk to my daughter about what color she could color herself um, because the colors at school only had, you know, five colors. And I, I thought to myself, that is such an interesting, poignant point because I remember when my daughter came home and at, at three years old and brought me her art, she colored herself brown. What does a, a black young, you know, girl color herself? If there's even something like coloring pencils that don't, have a variety of, of, of color. So I'm just curious to know if that is something that the district is also considering as they look at this framework. You know, are art teachers or art um, classes or vendors being asked to look at a variety as opposed to just one? I think that, I think we have a lot of work to do. And you're gonna find that there's teachers who are already doing some of this great work and teachers that aren't there yet. But we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, absolutely. And then, and then, it's one of our goals. And then, the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a lot of laryngitis. So, first of all, let's give Marika a huge round of applause. The power of these workshops are, uh, and these forums are to have honest, you know, raw discussions. And this is a school system of 12,000 employees. Um, are all 12,000 employees doing exactly what we want every single day? No. It's the honest truth. You know, I've been here since I'm 60 years old. I've been here since I'm five years old. So the, um, you know, and my kids have gone here and my grandchildren will go here. But our, the beauty that we have in Long Beach Unified is always a continuous improvement. And so, um, and I'm going to be blunt. Are we going to please every single person? No. 
not every day. Are we going to try to get better? Absolutely, yes. Because the data, um, and we look at tons of data, we look at tons of training, but the issue is we need everyone doing the work together. So, um, and I'm just going to be really, really honest with you, we can only move the mountain so much at a certain time because our teachers and our principals and everyone work really, really hard, but at the same time, their stress is good, and you can ask my staff, they'll tell you I put a lot of stress in people, but distress is bad. There is a breaking point in anything that we do, even for our children. So for example, 50% of our young people take AP courses, which is totally different than it was you know, five years ago. It's just huge. I talk to kids all the time, you do not need to take 12 AP courses. Why are you taking 12 AP courses? You know, you know, five is good, seven is good. You don't need 12, but everyone has to work on these. So we're, this is a continuous process, we'll continue to work on things. Um, the next topic you'll hear from Mr. Moskowitz is an, another great example of a, a process that's been started over a year ago, and it's gonna be a, an ongoing process addressing the reading piece. So I apologize again, oh, um, yes, Mrs. Kurt. Yes, you may. You're a board from, member. You may do what you choose. <laughs> um, and I'll speak on our behalf, and you can kick me if I'm misinterpreting. Um, this is such an important conversation, and I just want to assure people that from a board level, I, we collectively understand that this is a super important conversation, the idea of implicit bias, the idea of what's happening with the FAIR Act, and that we talk often as a board and talk to the superintendent who instructs staff around this important work, that this really is part of the conversation all the time about equity, about implicit bias. And so while we have a ton of work to do, um, just assuring people that there is a very strong awareness from the policy level of how important this work is. So it isn't that it's happening at one school site independent because one teacher or principal is really good at it. There really is a collective urgency around doing this work better. Um, I don't know. I Absolutely. Okay. You said it exactly well. So. Yeah. Hold on one minute. Dr. Baker might get up soon. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, because Dr. Baker will get up. Well, I actually wasn't going to talk about the a lot of work. I was just going to acknowledge that part of why you have staff attend sessions like this is to be supportive of parents and also to gather different perspectives to use in decision making. So while you you know while we're here to be observers and participants, we're really here to influence the work that we're doing on an everyday basis. And so you have multiple departments here that gather your perspective, and then we talk about how to use your perspectives in the work that we're doing. And yes, there's a lot of work that we're formulating on around equity and implicit bias um, that we'll, we, we'll, we will be proceeding with in the next year. And before I leave, remember, this is our last meeting of this year, but we will pick up again in the fall. And remember, we have that form that's actually in your Google Classroom, what's called special request form. So people can use that to request to have um, people come out uh, to meet with parents, to talk about these topics, to do all kinds of things. And people have done that as collective schools and, or individual schools. So again, it's a works in progress. It's a continuous improvement um, journey that we're on and for everything that we do. And so, um, so I'm going to turn over to Mr. Moskowitz and Dr. Baker and the rest of the team. So take care. All right. Good morning, everyone. Again, my, uh, my name is Brian Moskowitz. I'm the assistant superintendent of elementary schools. Um, I also appreciate I was sitting there. Um, every time I sit through presentations like this, I learn as well. Uh, think about how I can support our principals, to support their teachers in, in, in all of this work. Uh, Mr. Collins, I know, um, several years ago, uh, brought to our attention some things he wanted us to work on, and we're very appreciative of that. So anytime we're able to hear from parents and community members uh, about what they'd like to see in, in improvements at their schools, we always encourage uh, parents to start with the principal. That's their job is to make sure that the school is high functioning. Um, where it feels like the, the principal isn't able to accomplish what you want accomplished, you're always welcome to call any of our offices and then we'll support the principal to get, um, to get done what needs to get done. Uh, so I see some familiar faces. Some of you were with us at our evening parent forums this year. Um, as you know, there's both a morning and an evening parent forum. Three times this year, myself, uh, Dr. Jay Camarino at the Middle and Kate office, and Pete Davis at the high school office, at three of those nighttime uh, forums, we came and presented some information. And I was able to speak in December, February, and April around some changes we're engaging in around how we're assessing reading at the elementary level. And so for some of you, this will be a little bit of a, a review. And for the rest of you, it'll just be kind of an overview of where we were those three uh, evenings and then where we're headed into next year. 
So for many years in our district, um, we have had, over 20 years, I'll talk about in a moment, we've had this uh, promotion and retention policy. So we have a, a policy in our district that says that in order for students to promote at the elementary grades, grades one through five, to promote to the next grade level, they have to meet a minimum criteria. And as we looked at um, some new content standards, when new standards came about in California earlier this decade, we recognized that our district benchmarks, the reading assessments that we used in part to determine if students were ready to promote to the next grade, we recognized that those reading benchmark assessments may not fully assess students where we think they need to with new standards. So we talked back in February about our promotion retention policy. We talked a little bit about two uh, reading products, online products that our uh, teachers and students are using, Alexia Core 5 and Rapid. And then we talked about how we're going to use assessments moving forward. So when I reference the, those over 20 years of, um, of this policy, um, one of the components, there, there's a piece in math. Students need to meet a minimum criteria to promote in math. And they also have a minimum criteria they need to promote in reading. And if you wanted to know more specifically what that is, I, I put the uh, website up here. You're welcome to go to that on the A through Z index on our lbschools.net webpage. You can go to um, P for promotion retention but it'll take you to our elementary schools page. You could also go to the elementary office and find out um, information there related to promotion. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I did that in February. But we recognize that as we move forward, we, there's more efficient ways and more robust ways to measure student reading ability that kind of move beyond where we were 20 years ago when we started implementing the policy at that time. There's been some great collaboration. Uh, the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development really has taken the lead on this over many years, but more specifically over the last several years and looking at if we're going to change how we assess reading as part of our promotion retention policy, then what is going to be the replacement? And we don't do anything in Long Beach just haphazardly. We don't just find some beautiful thing on a shelf and order it and, and put it in place. We want to make sure it's the right thing to move forward. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how we did that and how we're shifting then from a single assessment, the single reading benchmark, which we had in, uh, for these many years, into a, a broader, more multiple measure approach to assessing reading as part of that promotion and um, overall re uh, student readiness. In December, I talked about a product called Lexia Core 5. Um, and all students, grades K through 5, uh, even TK has a little bit of uh, time to play with this. Um, all of our students this year have had the opportunity to work with Lexia Core 5. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it today. We talked about it in December. Uh, you can go on LexiaLearning.com, and you can actually see some good videos. There's a link right here. You can go uh, see some great videos on how it works. But I think what's most important as a reminder to everybody is before we implemented this at all of our schools, all of our K-5 and K-8 schools this year, this pro uh, product was being implemented as a, on a pilot level at several of our schools all the way back to uh, 2015, and I think even one school started in 2014. So we allowed schools with their own site funds, we do this every year, um, schools are given their own money, LCFF money, Title I money, to use what they and their, those in their community feel is most appropriate. And some of these schools decided back at that time that they wanted to try to use this product called Lexia Core 5. And it's a reading program that is individualized for students. It's computer adapted. It gives teachers real-time data on specific um, reading needs for each of their students. Um, and once we saw the great success at these pilot schools, then four years later, three or four years later this year, we were able to expand that. And the, the board and the superintendent purchased that for use in all of our schools. We provided some training, and we'll continue to do so. So that was a, a product called Lexia Core 5. In addition to that, this year, 15 schools uh, piloted a program, also Lexia product, but this is called RAPID. Don't ask me what those five letters stand for, because I just uh, drew a blank on what it stands for. But that Lexia RAPID assessment does a couple of things. It helps to measure the likelihood of students being able to read at grade level by the end of the year. So they take this assessment, students take this assessment in the fall, in the winter, and in the spring. Now different than our current reading benchmarks, our current reading benchmarks are administered to students when teachers feel those students are ready to take that assessment. They give them probable indicators, they give other assessments, and when now when students or when teachers believe a student is ready for that reading assessment, they take the reading assessment. 
differently with this Lexia Rapid product that we piloted again at these 15 sites this year, there are these three administration windows that all students will take the assessment during that window. It's an online assessment. In grades K2, there is a one-on-one -on -one component where the teacher actually hears the student reading to them uh, and does some face-to-face -face interaction because we know in order to assess a student's ability to read at those levels, at K1-2, you really need to hear the student and, and understand the nuances of how they're trying to decode and understand what they're reading. Um, so that's, that is the difference that, uh, in the way that the, uh, the, the Lexia product, Rapid, is being administered. But we, when we piloted it this year, uh, in conjunction with our research office, we found that there is a very strong correlation between the results on Lexia Rapid and how students are performing on our district reading benchmark assessments. So one of the nice things about it is if we're going to uh, start moving away from a single district reading benchmark and move to some other assessments, we want to make sure that they correlate and that there's, a strong, um, that there's a strong correlation between other things that we're doing to assess students. And we, um, we've seen this very strong correlation in these sites that piloted the work. So next year, uh, again, it, by, with support of our superintendent and our board, all of our schools, K-5 and K-8, students in grades K through 5, will be taking the Lexia Rapid assessments. So the district reading benchmarks that we've used for over 20 years are going to uh, go away. This will be the last year that we administer those. We're going to start administering Lexia Rapid, but it's not a one-to-one -one replacement. So whereas the district reading benchmarks were the, the, really the primary way we determined whether a student was ready to promote to the next grade. Now we're going to use a multiple measures approach, and one of those measures will be Lexia Rapid, the information that comes from that. Lexia Rapid measures really three areas. R measures word recognition. That would include things like can a student decode? Can they sound out a word? Can they read fluently across multiple uh, words into a sentence? It looks at academic language. So do they understand the vocabulary? Do, know, do they know what that word means? Can they use some context clues to understand what that word means? And it also includes reading comprehension. So if they read a sentence or they read a passage, are they able to answer some questions about what that means or what they read about? So the, the Alexia Rapid Screener measures in these three areas. And we can use those three areas then to help the teacher to make some informed decisions moving forward. So now rather than that one reading assessment, district benchmarks, we're going to establish a reading profile. And that reading profile for each student will help us to inform whether or not the student is ready to promote to the next grade at the end of the year. More importantly, it will help the teacher to understand what does that student need in order to improve. What are their specific areas um, that are strengths? And what are those specific areas that they need additional instructional support, individualized instructional support, to be able to move to that end of grade level and beyond uh, criteria? So take a moment, just read what the definition of a reading profile is. I think the key phrases that jump out to me as I read that is that it comes from a variety of assessments. So no one single assessment. And I think most importantly, it communicates and informs instructional next steps. So it communicates to the teacher, communicates to parents, and more importantly, it informs the teacher what needs to happen next. What are those next steps? So here are some ways that we are going to establish that reading profile at both K2 and 3.5. At K2, we currently have an assessment that uh, sometimes referred to as the FIRSA. That stands for Foundational Reading Skills Assessment. It measures uh, phonics, phonemic awareness, some word knowledge. At K2, that's a really important thing. We want to make sure that students not only can read individual sounds and words and put them into sentences and, and read fluently. Uh, and ultimately, we want to make sure they can comprehend as well. So that will continue to be an important component of our K2 uh, reading profile. We will use Lexia Core 5 and Rapid next year. We also, as part of our, we talked about curriculum in history social science, our curriculum for language arts at TK5 is, our, is Wonders. And there are assessments that are provided through Wonders that we'll continue to administer that will be part of this reading profile. And then teachers are regularly collecting data. They may be listening to a student read individually and taking some notes on how that student's reading. Uh, they may be in a small group with students, and they're hearing students having conversations with one another about what they see and what they understand. 
and teachers are taking anecdotal notes on that. And that'll be also be, those teacher observational notes will be just as important, really, as any other assessment that's given. So this reading profile in K2 will have, beyond just one district reading benchmark, it will have a broader uh, aspect to a student's reading ability. And then you can see a kind of the parallel on, in the grades three through five. In grades three through five, we're not as worried about the stu a student's ability to decode words. There are sometimes third graders that still have challenges, and so we may use components of foundational reading in support of those upper grade students. But it's really about, at that point, what, what is their ability to comprehend? Because that, we need to prepare them to move into middle school, that they're able to read more complex passages and be able to comprehend and discuss and interact with those um, complex passages. Otherwise, you see a good parallel um, across the grade levels. So that's one of the things we'll be moving into next year. We're, we're moving away from a single uh, reading benchmark to assess reading ability and moving into a broader reading profile. Next year, our teachers receive a lot of training. Some of that training happens um, at their site. The principal, uh, might be coaches from the curriculum office go out and provide support at a site. Um, so there's a lot of professional development that happens at a school site. There's also professional development that might happen centrally. And this next year, we will be able to provide all of our elementary teachers with 18 hours of face-to-face -face training at the district level, specifically around how to administer Alexia Rapid, how to analyze that data, and most importantly, what do you do with that? So you have this data, now what? What do you do to make sure you're um, using those instructional processes to meet the needs of those students that may be falling out a bit from the data as it's shown? We will be uh, working next year to align this reading profile, a broader uh, reading profile, to our district's promotion retention policy and seeing where that alignment is. Um, and then I think really importantly, we want to make sure next year we're looking at way the best ways to communicate results to parents and guardians. And so on that point, I have a question for all of you. I'm going to give you a, a couple of minutes to give me some uh, feedback as well. If I can get a couple of folks just if you can pass these a uh, couple around to each table. So my question is, what do you as parents and guardians, it might be if you might be a, a parent of a 12th grader, so you can still provide input on this. What do parents and guardians want to know about their stu students' reading abilities? So if you were to receive a report home, what would you want to know as a parent about your students' reading abilities? So we, not everyone needs to fill one out. You could just do it at a table if you want to, I'm sorry, I didn't, if you can just uh, pass a couple out at each table. Um, have a discussion at your table. And maybe one or two of you can take notes or, and write it down on the paper. You can write it in English or Spanish. We will um, take all of that feedback. So take about three or four minutes and just make a list on this paper and I'll collect the paper back. What do you want to know about your student's reading ability? If I can have everyone's attention, please. Finish your last thought. Eyes back up here. You can hear my voice. If you can just raise your hand, I'll know you're ready. Awesome, thank you. So I'm gonna, if you can leave these at the table, we'll collect those at the end. If you have some things that pop in your head uh, as uh, Chris Lund comes up in a moment, you can write those down. One of the things that we wanna make sure we're doing next year is we know that our teachers are gonna receive a lot of training, a lot of information and ways that they can help their, their students. But some things that I heard walking around were how can we as parents get some information to know how we can help our children? So. Will there be enough specificity in what we hear that we can get books from the library or get books from the bookstore or go online to provide? So that would be one of the things we'd want to make sure we're able to do is communicate with parents to, so that you know where your child's reading so that you can support that at home. Were there a couple other things that really were felt important either in that conversation or from anything else that I shared you'd like uh, me to answer a question or two? program related just like this. Yeah. So uh, there's not a specific math program related to that. We do have another math program in our elementary schools that I've talked about before called uh, ST Math, sometimes referred to as GG Math. It is computer adapted. It is specific to uh, align to math standards. Students are able to kind of go through in a little bit of a gamification mode and enhance their math skills. So it's um, not exactly in the same format, but there is that online support for students in mathematics. Can I ask about the teacher support? Uh, there are times when I do like email or ask the teacher to give my son a little support. It's almost always in math. Um, sometimes it's challenging because she has 35 students 
And, and I realize it, but then he's not able to get that. Like he comes home with a worksheet, he doesn't get it. I do it with him, so he gets it with me, but deep down I know, well, we did it together. I still don't know if he could do it by himself, so I email the teacher, can you check? But sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, because she has 35 kids. So how do we, I, I know it's money issues, but with 35 kids, how does a teacher really individualize that instruction? Right. So uh, it's a great question. I think one of the ways that we're through the training next year, this is not new, what, what I'm about to say. Many of our teachers are already doing this, but we'll be reinforcing this with, with all of our teachers. One of the nice things about the data that comes from things like Core 5 and Rapid is that you can find out what specific needs an individual student might have. So you might have a specific need, but Chuck might have the same need that comes that I see as a teacher as I'm reading the, the data that comes out of those reports. There may be a third student that has the same need. And so what I can do is during my workshop time, during my guided reading time, I can actually pull the three of you together, so it's not just individual work, but I can pull three or four students, six or seven students of those 35 that have the same need and provide that, individual, or that individualized small group support in that way. So the, the data that comes from it, it could be individual support for students, but more likely you're going to be pulling students from your class that have the same need or similar need and providing that work. So part of the training again for, for teachers is how do you do that in a workshop format, keeping all the other students engaged in high level rigorous tasks but we'll also provide that individual support. But yeah, it's great. Yes? When we talk about reinforcements, um, I think there's no other better example at the school sites as a librarian. Um, in the past, I had the opportunity to um, have librarians alongside me to speak um, in front of the board to bring um, a focus on funding to ensure that the librarians, you know, the program stays strong. But once again, you know, librarians are approaching me again to bring the importance of securing funding at the elementary level to provide more library time. And I think that's a big reinforcement. I see that firsthand at the, at the elementary where I'm at and um, as a parent. And um, you know, just twice a week isn't enough. Maybe in some schools it's once a week that they have a librarian. Because I don't know if everybody knew this, but not all children have the access to a library. So there are some students, particularly at Riley, um, that they don't have the ability to go with their parents and get check out a book at the library. So the only time that they do have is when they do visit the library at the school site. And you should hear the, the joy that they have going to the library. And so sometimes it may happen where the librarian is pulled, and that's happening right now, when they're pulled in different directions and then they don't get to go on that specific day that the kids look forward to, and they're very bummed out. <laughs> so I wanted to bring attention to that and if the board or the district can perhaps find a way to bring those that library librarian time back yeah. for at least I don't know, 50% or 60%, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, we know that uh, the superintendent had to leave. If he was standing up here, he would probably tell you that we know, we recognize that there are way more needs uh, than we have resources to support. So yes, I think we're all in agreement that librarians are a great resource for our students, and we would all love to have more library time. It's just a matter of finding that balance with other resources. Some schools do um, use their LCFF and Title I monies that they receive to increase the, the library time over what's allocated by the district. Um, but yes, I mean, your point is definitely heard, and I know all those on this side of the room would, would, would agree. It's just a matter of finding the, you know, what to do with those very limited resources. Last question here, and then yes. Would you like to? Okay. Well, you know, we have a homework helpline in this district. Uh, any student can call at any time, 4 to 6, uh, Monday through Thursday. And the, the number is 562-437-2859. 562-437-2859. I've often said that if we had this when I was in school, I'd be a Rhodes Scholar. <laughs> I think one more question, then I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lund. Yes. Um, since we're talking about resources and money that's being allocated, how much money was spent on this program? And is that like a decision that the school is making and is that a decision where like the, alloc the resources could be allocated to more time with libra librarians um, versus like the money on this software to keep it going? I'm just curious. I think it's a great program, but I'm curious if there's a, a resource issue. Well, yes, again, there's always going to be issues with how the, the amount of financial resources and then what is the best use of that. One of the things that we found from the, the uh, Lexia products is that the, the best resource for any student is going to be the, the classroom teacher. 
So there's a lot of great additional supports, whether it's counseling time, whether it's library time. There's a lot of other supports that will also be beneficial. We think the greatest support for students is what's happening in the classroom with their teacher. And one of the things that these Lexia products do is they provide very specific data to that teacher that we haven't had before. That can, that can really uh, drill down to what students need to move forward. And in the data that we've seen in our own schools that have implemented it is that students are actually able to um, grow at a faster rate and get a lot more individualized support from their classroom teacher through that. So it's not necessarily, is it should we do Lexia or should we increase library time? What we were looking for in this regard was how can we give teachers, the classroom teacher, the greatest access to data that will allow them to provide those really um, specific individualized supports for students to accelerate their reading in the classroom. Because you feel like it's more individualized if you have it through this program. So I think, I think the decision was how can we give teachers access to the best data so that the classroom teacher can provide those individualized supports. It wasn't how can, should we do this versus having more library time. That was, that was never in the discussion. Why? The because the conversation was how can we give teachers that data because they're with the students six hours a day. Mm -hmm. Even if we had a full-time librarian, they're going to see students once a week instead of once every other week versus the classroom teacher who's with them all day long. Resources and they were around more, right? I'm sorry? Unless they like gave more money to librarians to be around more often, correct? And I'm just trying to see if I misunderstand. You, you need there. to find out what the children need and just bringing in another resource, like another librarian, which is good, right. that librarian needs to find out what does a child need. And so you're still, you're still focusing on the same problem of yeah. trying to identify what it is that you need to do with that child. Yeah. And so I think the district's on the right track, trying to, ident trying to find a, a strategy to identify the children's needs so that they can be addressed. A librarian is good, but you're going to have the same problem right. of identifying well, the need. And, and there, there are a lot of resources that we, we could increase instru uh, a, a teacher on special assignment. We could increase instructional aids. There are a lot of additional people we could bring in to support students, and, and all of those could do some effective work in increasing student performance. But we also know that the classroom teacher is the most critical one to make that happen. And if they don't have the most specific data, it's going to be challenging for them. So again, I, I appreciate your, your perspective on where that's coming from. And yes, there are other things we might be able to use some of those resources for. But we, we believe that this product is giving the most important person in that student's life, the classroom teacher, more specific individualized data so that they can increase the, the uh, reading support in the classroom. So thank you. I mean, ideally, that anytime we are increasing student ability to read. We hope to see that um, come out into the, in results on, on our SPAC test. We don't do that so we can increase our results on our SPAC assessments. We do it so we can increase student reading ability. And if it shows up in SPAC, that's even better. Yeah, all right. Thank you all very much, appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Moskowitz. My name is Christopher Lund. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Research and School Improvement. And you've heard me all before because we've done a lot of work together over the last two years around our College and Career Readiness Guide. So our College Career Readiness Guide, our spring guide, was actually just sent out this week on Monday to our parents and students. So if you have a high schooler, you should have received some kind of notification that that guide has been posted. And I did get some emails from some of you, so I know that that's, that is the case. My own son, who is a ninth grader, received his guide as well. And we actually had some very thoughtful discussions based on that guide. So I know as a parent, I really appreciated that. So that guide that we did for our college and career readiness actually started three years ago as a two-page college readiness guide and evolved into a nine-page college career readiness guide based on your input. So part of that is really utilizing your perspective as parents throughout our system to really create and customize a guide from, based on your feedback. Also based on your feedback was why just for high school students? Why not lower this down to our middle schools? So I am happy to report that we are moving forward with that and our high school readiness guide, which you have also helped conceptually develop, will come out this fall for our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students. 
You have a copy of that on your table in your packet. You have the English version. También hay una copia en español en cada mesa. Entonces, uh, so we've already translated that into Spanish. So you, there is a Spanish copy available. There's also an initial Kamai copy that uh, we have available that we can post for you as well. The high school readiness guide, as I said, is really targeting our middle school students and their preparedness for high school. For those of you that have been through the high school of choice process, you know how complex that process is. With choice comes complexity. Back in the day where we only had one high school based on your residence and that's the high school that you go to, there was very little to choose from. That was your high school. Now we have up to 40 plus pathways that students can choose based on a lot of different factors. So the high school guide, high school readiness guide is an attempt to capture all those different factors. So we started with, I think conceptually, upwards of 17 pages for this guide. We have now uh, pared that down to 10 pages that you see in front of you. Only eighth graders will re actually receive the entire full 10 pages. Seventh graders actually receive fewer pages, nine pages, one fewer page. Sixth graders actually are only getting a four, a four page guide, if I remember correctly. And that was based on your feedback as well of really kind of ramping that up as students move through the grade levels. The first page, as you see, uh, has a little introduction as well as a summary of important data at the bottom of that guide that really relates to the school of choice process how many pathways you're currently qualified for based on your data, uh, the importance of math as it relates to those assessments uh, in terms of qualification for certain pathways, your ELA aspect data as it relates to our non-industry pathways, PACE, Quest, CIC, WAVE, Merit, and what math program you're currently in because the math program that you're currently in opens up additional doors for algebra placements. And when you're in algebra, that opens up nine additional pathways. So all this is an effort to really give all of our parents the information early on in terms of that high school readiness and additional options as it relates to that. Page two is really a map of our district and where our schools are located to help parents get a, an idea and students of where our high schools are, as well as some uh, links to where to uh, connect certain bus routes to those different high schools. So this is really the, the broad pr uh, perspective in terms of one, what is your local school? And then two, what high schools could I access more easily than others? The third page, as we've talked about before, is a summary of all of our high schools, the size of those high schools, the number of pathways within those high schools, whether uniforms are required or not, and then what sports programs and performing visual and performing arts programs are available in each of those high schools. And that was really something that our students said that they wanted access to. So that's the summary of all of our high schools based on that broad information. Specifically, we survey our students, and this was based on our discussions, on what careers they might be interested in. So we built into our core survey this year that was administered in January and February, questions related to career interest. And these were student-friendly questions. So instead of saying, are you interested in engineering? Are you interested in medicine? We actually gave them questions like, do you like to build things with Legos? Do you like to build online? Do you like to uh, take things apart and put them back together? Do you like to help your little sister with their homework? You know, those sort of questions that might lead to, hey, you might be interested in teaching. You might be interested in engineering. You might be interested in science or mathematics based on this level of questioning. Yes, please. They already took the survey in January, yes. And the survey specifically asked the questions that you see on this sample. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sixth and seventh grader, actually. So our, our sixth and seventh graders took, this, uh, took these questions. It really lengthened their survey quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's our reality of our middle schoolers, right? So. You have questions that really helped identify what their three career interests might be. And that's called out then on this page, here's what your students actually said. So I felt as a parent, it might be good to know what your students actually said were their career interests. And then 
whether transportation was important, meaning that is going close to home, going to a school close to home, important to you and your family? Is sports important to you, competitive sports programs? And then is visual and performing arts programs important to you? And the reason we're asking those questions is really going back to that prior page, that if you are heavily invested in sports, you're gonna have more options at certain schools than you will at other schools. If you're looking for specific sports programs, lacrosse or rugby or swimming or surfing, whatever it may be, there are limited sports at, limited, at certain programs, at certain high schools. So knowing which high schools offer which sports programs can help guide that decision. In addition, what performing arts programs might be available. So if orchestra or band or theater arts is important to you, making sure that your high school has those programs available. So we attempt to capture that information on this page, as well as then, as you see at the bottom right, a way of exploring additional interests. And this also came out of our parent group of what additional community-based resources are available to our parents and students to kind of explore other areas of interest. The next page is our, all of our pathways by industry, which pathways exist in which high school. We've highlighted the three that this particular student expressed interest in. So you can see those other columns that are highlighted there. And these, as we've talked about before, will all have embedded links to the high school websites and the pathway websites. Page six and seven is really preparedness for certain pathways based on their area of interest. And we've made multiple revisions to this document. So in this case, you see this particular student expressed interest in a health science medical career area. And we've listed every pathway that is available in, in the district connected to that industry. We've also pulled in the number of AP courses that students on average take within that pathway as well as what percent of students go on to college within that particular pathway. So this all, once again, came out of our discussions with you and with students as to saying, help me learn as much as I can about this pathway um, and what's being said about it. So you'll have some comments from students at that final stage there. And then this STARS sort of recommendation is kind of like your preparedness at this point for each of those pathways. There's additional career surveys there at the bottom including one to uh, Long Beach City College that just came out that they made available to us through our partnership to explore other career areas. So if you look at this and go, gosh, son, I didn't realize you wanted to go into math and science and he or she goes, no, I didn't either. Well, then let's explore other options there with using some additional tools online. Page seven is really the two additional options that the student indicated. And we're replacing the third option there for any student that is approaching or meeting the criteria for our, what historically has been our most competitive pathways. What are really essentially our non-industry pathways. These would be like PACE and WAVE and QUEST and MERIT and such. So if a student is uh, close to that criteria, meeting that criteria, we are going to suggest to them to consider these particular pathways. Um, and that's what you see there at the bottom. And you can see why they are so competitive, that on average our students at Wilson Way, for example, take 11 AP courses. That's the average. So you can imagine we have students that actually graduated last year from Wilson that took 16 AP courses. That was our highest in the district. So obviously if you want a hyper-competitive program, they are available for you. Um, if, my, like my son, he did not want that hyper-competitive program, and actually that dissuaded him from choosing that level of program, despite my coercion. <laughs> <laughs> so, page, uh, the next page here, page eight, is only for our eighth graders, and this is our mentor list. So once again, this came out of your feedback of providing our students mentors. So these are our up upcoming 11th and 12th grade students who have agreed to be a contact for our current middle school students. And the students self-identified on their survey. We've given those names to our high school counselors for their stamp of approval. And then we are also reaching out to the parents of these students so that they know that their student has put their name in a hat to say that they could be contacted by a rising high school student. So we're gonna give them specifically students that went to their own middle school. So you attended Washington Middle School. These are high schoolers that also attended Washington when they were in middle school. 
that are now in these different pathways as a way of reaching out to them to learn more about the pathway. And you see some sample questions there at the bottom that you might ask that mentor. The next page is your middle school grades. Starting to pay attention to middle school grades because they matter. They matter on multiple levels. One, they determine your academic GPA, which is used for the criteria for upwards of 24 pathways for admission purposes. Two, grades matter in high school. Kids kind of learn a bad habit in middle school that through social promotion that I move on to seventh grade math even though I failed sixth grade math. In high school, that doesn't happen. You fail algebra, you repeat algebra. You fail geometry, you repeat geometry. So really starting to send that message that grades do matter, and here's why. They matter in middle school for the academic GPA, for admission to certain pathways. They matter in high school, obviously, for graduation, A to G, and college acceptance. And then finally, your uh, physical fitness test actually matters too. So that was a reference there on whether you've passed your physical fitness test, because that actually exempts you then from two years of PE in high school. The last page is your recommendation page, your timeline of events, um, taking advantage of our open house nights. So our high schools are actually having their open house night in two weeks. That's a great opportunity to learn about the different pathways. Uh, in addition, there's summits that occur in the fall that parents can attend to learn about the different pathway options. So we will customize the recommendations to the grade level of the student. Sixth grade students will get different recommendations than seventh grade and eighth grade. Okay? So that's basically where we ended up in our 10-page guide after really a full year of work now in this development. So any, uh, <laughs> yes, it's, it's come to be. <laughs> The whole goal here is really building capacity throughout our system around the school of choice process, giving parents and students as much information as possible on how this process works, supporting our college readiness guide at the early age with the high school readiness guide. And yes, I know there's probably a middle school readiness guide probably in the works somewhere for our elementary students, but this is our next step. The other next step, we are developing an app. We submitted a grant, a half million dollar grant for app development for a college readiness app that would actually update with additional information throughout the year as data comes in. So we know once we publish our guide, there's always additional data that comes in. So having an app that students can use, that's fun, that's gamified, that allows them to compete against their friends around college readiness, that's all in the works. And once again, that was an idea that you guys brought to me. So Mrs. Coleman. Thank you so much for an amazing um, high school readiness. Uh, my question is to achieve the 100% graduation, because I know by fact that 50% of our students uh, do not complete the A through G requirement. Is there a possibility we must change the A through G requirement to benefit all students um, to make it possible for students that they, their career path is going to a different direction and also when, because when I look at the stat in, um, in Long Beach Unified School District, our kids are still failing. We must close that academic gap and with all these beautiful programs that we come up, what can we do? As parents, I attended all meetings, and uh, I've been in the district and supported f since 2008. Um, I am such an advocate for education for our children, because as my mother said, we are the hearts. Our children are the heartbeats. And every time when I look at our statistics that our students are failing, it, it's right into my heart, because that's the reason why I volunteer all the time to make sure that we close that academic gaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have information we learn every single meetings, but I do not see that in our local area, the principal had power to change whatever they want or, or selected certain things to help their own school. I brought issues that we need to look at the progress and make sure that, you know, the academic gaps is closed. Mm -hmm. No more failing, no more um, uh, less graduation, 100% graduation for our students. So um, 
as a parent, I, I'm kind of disappointed in more, more ways than another, and especially for our Pacific Islander. So I am speaking out to uh, inform you that because it takes 12 years to see changes, but the A3G requirement is not for all. We need to have another method because we always say kids fail. No, kids don't fail their kids. System fail our children. This is how we always talk about. We improve 2%. We uh, met our goal. As long as we have failing in our system, as long as our children are failing, we are not in any way closing that academic gap. So uh, one, we've made some significant gains in A to G over the past five years. 42% of our students met A to G five years ago. This past year is 56%. So we're actually over 50% now. So that 14% gain over the last five years is, is really significant. Many of our high schools are actually upwards of 60, 70%. 75% of our students go on to college. So whether you meet A, or G, A to G or not, you can still go on to college. You go on to a community college if you didn't meet A to G. If you've met A to G, you can still go to community college or you can go to a four-year college. Our goal with our pathways is not to mandate that you go to college. Our goal with our pathways is to make college an option for you. That's our hope, is that if you choose to go to college, you can do so based on your preparedness during high school. That's our hope. Um, and the goal is really 100%. And that's, we'll never say that we've met our goal until you really get that 100% of at least saying that they are eligible to go to college if they choose to which obviously requires meeting graduation requirements, meeting A to G requirements. All of our pathways do have A to G as their foundation. Um, with that said, we've rolled out some new tools for our counselors to really monitor A to G and grad requirements. So we've really refined our data system so that our counselors know explicitly which students need which courses that, and where they're falling out and intervening at an earlier age because you can't wait till they're in 11th and 12th grade and then say, now we gotta get you back on track. If you are off track in ninth grade, we need to intervene in ninth grade. And that, and that can happen. After your first semester of ninth grade, if you fail your English class, you fail your math class, you fail your PE class, you are off track. So how do we get you back on track through independent study, through summer school, or some other means? And that's really how refined our data system now allows messaging to our counselors to say, this student needs a second semester math course in this, or a first semester course in history, a second semester math uh, world history course to get them back on track. That's our hope. This is an incredible, uh, tangible example of a wonderful tool, resource. Um, my favorite part about it, not that the other parts are not as important, but is the potential mentors. I think that that's definitely a powerful tool to have one child or one student to another be a support system. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess at the end I can ask you how my son can be of support to a future incoming high schooler. And then lastly, um, parents need mentors too. You know, we, we need you know, we go. guidance as well. I mean, mentorship <laughs> Page is very important. <laughs> so, um, you know, I encourage, again, everyone here to just pass on the word. And there's always going to be a need everywhere. And, I mean, even in the morning walks, you know, when you right. overhear a conversation or a parent. I happen to be in PTA, and so people ask me for, you know, resources. And that's a great way of connect, connecting or networking at the parent-to-parent -parent level. That's a great so, suggestion. Yeah. Over 2,000 of our high school students signed up to be a mentor. So I think that's also a credit to our students' own willingness to help other kids. So that was great. Yes. Thank you. My name is Diamond, Diamond Hopkins, and I am a grandma of nine children, I mean grandchildren, in all the school districts in uh, Long Beach. And I want to compliment you all for your Love and support in all of your programs and everything that you have done and working on for every year uh, for the children because we do need this. And also the support of the parents, this is great. Um, <clears throat> I just want to um, ask a question because uh, the resources that you have and all the programs and a lot of money and the funds that we're putting in and we're still asking every year, all year for funds for all these programs and everything. And like Malaya was saying, you know, that 50% or more than, you know, of us, um, not just uh, Pacific Islander failing, you know, uh, I don't know when this statistic came up, because uh, I'm new, 
and also um, we need to put our work and our uh, in efforts into helping these stu students children and also along with the parents to help and support as a team working together to make it a successful uh, time for the children to graduate and bring up this uh, number higher than what it is because it doesn't work I mean we can have a lot of programs and a lot of things to help but when it's not working then we should uh, you know get a statistics, a, a statistics uh, excuse me statistics of the programs that are working and put our money and time into the ones that are not working you know and it also helps the students and bring up this rating of 50 percent to 100 percent because time is of essence this is as everything else i have to take time from work but it's worth my time it's for my students for my children and for everybody's uh, everybody's student children is our children and uh, the love that we have and the support i compliment you all very highly and thank you very much for the time and effort and all your your hard working for it and us parents too thank you very much for all the love and supports in question because if we don't come together as a community we don't be we're, our kids are not going to be success you know and they need us and we do have a lot of other issues with uh, the superiors as far as the leaders in our school districts which are the principals i've never experienced such thing until i went through it myself not for me but for a relative you know that uh, the principal did not have any time and we personally went there personally four times and still don't have any time uh, to meet with us personally since she failed to take any messages or whatsoever I know everybody's busy but making the time and effort because we are all supporting and paying them to make it to do a job well done and you know the support that we have as a parents and also uh, sidetrack with that uh, the money and funds that we do put in to help and uh, support the schools and our students and they reject it and they're not accepting it that's unacceptable we always need money for our students and our school so this is a very first time I experienced it you know myself with one of our students you know so I hope this gets any uh, resolved with the superintendent thank somewhere. you diamond I thank appreciate you, very you much. being here and I thank you all for I know many of you have been here uh, an ongoing uh, participant for not just this year but for many years now so thank you so much uh, I guess I, I would just end with saying that the guide is really a testament to your voice and really your suggestions as it relates to that. So I hope that it not just benefits your students, but really benefits our entire student uh, population and, and supporting all parents in, in those important decisions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Baker, who's gonna run a, our closing and... Thank you, sorry. That's okay, all right. <laughs> um, you know, question about the school of choice. So my son, we, we chose not to go to our, uh, the home school. Mm -hmm. We you know, did our research and we chose to go to a different school, which was great. And then for our middle school, again, we did the research. We chose to go to another school, which is great. My question is, has, has there been any discussion either at the board level or at the administrative level of, like, are there certain schools that, that parents are opting out of a lot and are there any resources when you notice that, golly, nobody's picking this homeschool? I don't know, maybe that's not the case. It felt like the case in my neighborhood, again, just completely anecdotal. All of my friends' families were saying, oh, no, we're not going to go to that local one. We're going to go to a to different ones. Mm -hmm. Is there any help that that school is being provided? Is, or yeah, so you bring up two important factors. One is the perception, is the, you know, is the perception reality, or how do we change perception, perhaps, with local community schools? The second is how do we offer programs that perhaps parents want to change their perception of that local school? So what additional programs can we pull into that school site? Our dual immersion programs, our science programs, STEM programs, whatever it is that might make that local school more attractive, if that's what the parents really want. So it's working through that, looking at those opt-outs, because uh, we do track all that data of how many parents are choosing not to go to that local school, and then seeing what additional supports we can provide. Yeah, I can uh -oh, only that school has low scores. Yeah, I can just assure you that we do look at that as a as a consideration and as in terms of our own placements and programs within our school sites. 
So I want to take a minute to have you process. We've had three really important topics and big topics today. Um, and I hear a lot of your voice about what do you do with the information that you that you seek or that you receive today. So why don't you take a couple minutes at your table and think about what are you taking away as a parent and as the perspective that you've heard today. And then the second part is, and who will you talk to about what you've heard today? Who is it that you need to have a conversation with? I also, while you're doing that, look around at your table. These materials that are around the room are for you. So if you'd like to make a commitment to take handouts or other things to somebody else, there are extras here. You can pick up the materials that are at another table and commit to sharing them with somebody, whether it's your principal and or somebody else, so that you can start another conversation. So two things, what are you taking away? and then talk about who and how you'll share the information that you're taking away today. And I'm gonna give you, I'm watching the clock, we're, we're on time, so about two or three minutes at your table so that you're sharing ideas among parents and then I'll come back up. Okay, I'm going to call you back in five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's come back together. Thank you. What your conversation shows me is that there's a lot to talk about. Um, and there's a lot to take back to your school. So I wanna also invite my colleagues who did presentations this morning up to um, be here to answer questions. You have great expertise in our team. Um, different than when Chris is here, I know you have a lot of personal engagement with him. Today I'm gonna invite my team up here. And as they're coming up, I, um, I was thinking about all of the things in the next couple of weeks that parents can be involved with. And these are only the things that I went to our district master calendar and found. So I wanna name off some things that you can take back to your, your um, communities. So this week is Teacher Appreciation Week across the state and in Long Beach Unified School District. It would be great if by tomorrow, if you have a teacher who has really helped your student or has had a great impact on your student, write them a little note. Even, even a small note makes a difference to our teachers. And so we encourage you to show your appreciation for them by writing a note or having your students write a note. It's a really good habit for a student to learn how to express, um, even in the earliest years, how to express their appreciation for their teachers. Um, open house is coming up, so I'm gonna say the dates. Not every single school has open house on these dates. Some of them choose alternate dates. So double check before you show up. But elementary open house is on May 22nd. That's the standard date. Double check to make your, sure your school is doing it. Middle school is on May 21st. And high school is on May 23rd. High schools are trying something new this year. You should see lots of link learning exhibits and the connection to the pathways that Chris Lund talked about when he was talking about that guide. So it is, we intend for it to be a different feel at high schools and we hope that you will also feel it. Um, we have a presence in the um, Long Beach Pride Festival. Our Board of Education member, Megan Kura, who left here earlier, is the Grand Marshal of the Parade. We have many students and staff who will be participating in those events in Long Beach. It's May 18th and 19th, and the parade is on the 19th. Um, we have our STEM fair, formerly called the Science Fair, coming up on May 18th, also 9 to 12 at Cabrillo High School. It's a great way, whether you have little ones that want to explore things and touch things and see things, please bring your little ones and also big ones to come see the projects, even if they're not presenting. In, um, the week of May 20th is our classified employee. Uh, this district has tons of classified employees that behind the scenes make it so that your teacher, your students' teachers can do a great job of teaching by taking care of everything from buses to food to maintenance to everything. And so, again, write a note. Is this, has the secretary been supportive of you? Has a rec aid been friendly? Please feel free to, to acknowledge them. We would love that. And then the last one I caught at the end of May, Coalition of African American Parents, and Kim, you may be able to speak more to this, but May 30th, 6 o'clock at the TRC. I know they're always looking to increase participation of those as allies and African American parents who want to be a part of the coalition that, that supports students in our district.
Same, same day, May 30th, and where is it, Mrs. Coleman? Okay, here in this room at? 6.30 to 8. Great. So, um, so I'm going to give prizes away on behalf of Mr. Steinhauser, and then staff, if you have questions about reading, about the Fair Education Act, about the High School Readiness Guide, or anything else, we will stay posted to answer questions for you, and we're really glad that you were here. I also want to invite you, um, Pamela brought books that relate, the books that um, Dr. Manos talked about. You might want to look at these. These are the, the books that teachers will receive and that give them different resources for introducing aspects that you heard about today in the Fair Education Act. You're welcome to, to take these and peruse them. Okay, so get your tickets ready. This is always a fun way to end. And as usual, Chris has got really nice sweets for you. Um, including a couple of gift cards for sweets and then a movie t uh, movie ticket so okay I'm coming out to have you draw the names or the numbers uh, last four our last ones uh, last, three. last last three numbers four seven two four seven two anyone going once Going twice. Four, eight, four. Maria. Four, seven, seven. Four, seven, seven. You got it? Great. Okay, good. Pick something. Yeah, put that one. I'm going to pull one more. Okay, we've got 477 coming up, 464, anyone? Great. <laughs> 446, a 446, it's yours? But did you have it? Yeah, go ahead, no, go ahead. Four six zero. Good. I'm glad. So we have a berry pie left, an apple cinnamon pie, and a chocolate cake. Okay. Not the books at this point. <laughs> so one more, <laughs> Dr. Turin time. All right. Four six three. Four six three. Anyone? All right. Chocolate cake. Apple pie, berry pie. Four, five, seven. Anyone for? Great, great. <laughs> you predicted it. <laughs> All right, apple it is. And very, berry. Oh, good job. Well, thank you very much for a great morning. We we will stand by for questions if you want to engage with us and have a great rest of your day.